great to see you all. Uh, my name again is Ted, and I'm here because uh, JJ is gone for the next two weeks. He's uh, in Hawaii. So everybody feeling, and uh, JJ, if you're watching, uh, have fun. So there we are. So it's great to be here. Uh, I always consider it a privilege to be able to uh, stand up here before you and and open God's word together. There's nothing better than that than to let God's word through his Holy Spirit uh, do something miraculous, supernatural. And who is ex came expecting something uh, more than what you can do in yourself that, that God would meet you in a way like that? I am. I have been. And uh, I've always already had that experience. Uh, the worship was great this morning, and uh, I have, Carolyn and I are taking care of two of my grandsons uh, this weekend, and I was able to sit back there with them uh, on my lap and, and to worship, and that was good. That was good for my soul, and um, so thank you for joining in that. So for the next two weeks, uh, we're going to consider two different psalms from the prayer book of God's people called the book of Psalms. Uh, the book of Psalms is made up of 150 poems and have been used for thousands of years for worship and for prayer and for insight to God, his will and his ways and his mysteries as our lives intersect with that which is seen and unseen in God's kingdom. And that's the book of Psalms. So we get to look at two of them these next two weeks. And I hope that you find them in just in your regular rhythms of life, that the book of Psalms are part of them. Um, there's a number of ways you can read the book of Psalms. You can just have one a week that you read and keep track of it that way. If you want to be a little bit more aggressive in your reading of the book of Psalms, uh, just um, do it like this. So you'll, the day of the month... Uh, so like the second uh, day of the month, you times that by five, and you go to the fifth, uh, five times two is ten. So then subtract four <laughs> and start at that psalm and read through ten, and then you'll get through the whole book of Psalms in 30 days in one month. <laughs> now I'm going to ask how many of you actually understood that. Raise your hand. Okay, so I was just looking for the engineers out there. You'd have that. Oh, that's an equation. I've got that. Okay. The book of Psalms is important, and it's good that you read them. So this morning, we're going to the 95th Psalm. Uh, we're going to have it up here on the screen for you to look at as I read it. Also, I'm sure many of you have your Bibles. You might want to open it up. Uh, so it's a poem found in the Old Testament, Psalm 95, but we find the redemption of it in the New Testament. And so we're going to see how that works uh, this week. So Psalm 95, uh, let me pray and then I'll read it. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is active and powerful, not static and stale. I, I thank you that it is dynamic and it changes us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that as we sit with it, as we read it, as we consider it, that you would work in ways that would shock us as we look back upon this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So Psalm 95, it says this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands are formed the dry land. Isn't that amazing? That's who God is. Come, let us worship. Let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, 
And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Good news, huh? Uh, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in Meribah, as you did that day in Massah in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years I was angry with them, that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So uh, there's great tension in this chapter. You may have picked it up. A a tension between where it begins and where it ends. It it begins with worship over God, over his greatness, about his creative powers, uh, about the stability of life that he offers us, and about the privilege of being his people and under his care. Good news. Great news. News that should cause us to to bring celebration and praise to him. But then it ends. It ends uh, remembering Israel's fear. uh, Their disobedience. Their judgment. And then that last phrase, a declaration, they will never enter into God's rest. So, so this poem is a poem that was used to remind Israel of the failure that they experienced because they embraced fear more than living in faith, in faith that God was almighty and that he knows and he, that he cares. I, uh, I used to have a hammock. You know what a hammock is? A hammock, uh, you know, a long piece of cloth you put between two stable places and then you lay in it and rest. Well, I used to have a hammock. I don't anymore, but I used to, and I'll tell you why I used to. So uh, right Memorial Day weekend, I would set up the hammock. It would take me about a half hour to set up the hammock. I had to climb on a ladder, get in the garage, and try not to injure myself, get it down, go outside, set it up. And then Labor Day, I would do the reverse, tear it down and put it up uh, back in storage. Now, I had great intention when I set the hammock up, but you know the reality of it is I spent about a half hour during the summer laying in the hammock. So if you do your math, I spent one hour to try to find, a, and in reality, I found a half hour rest from the hammock. It didn't work for me. But that really is kind of an illustration of uh, what life is like sometimes. We have good intentions, but it just doesn't play out oftentimes around rest because sometimes rest takes a lot of work. I I have a watch here, and uh, it has something, it it keeps track of, it keeps track of how much I exercise, how many steps I take, it keeps track of my sleep, it it keeps track of my heart rate, it takes, keeps track of everything, and every morning I can look at my watch, and it will tell me what my body battery is. Does anyone have a watch like that? It tells you how much energy you have at the beginning of the day. So I'm proud to say that this morning I had 77 out of 100, and that's about my best. Yesterday it was 24. Uh, We're taking care of my grandkids, like I mentioned, and they have a dog, and the night was long. But I'm getting better. So this morning I want us to consider the whole subject of rest. From a different perspective, though, not rest as rest in recuperation from work, 
but rest being something that God calls us to enter into. Those are two very different things. Um, This type of rest that we're going to be looking at is not rest as a result of uh, having lots of spare time or, or rest based upon an upcoming vacation, summer vacation, or a rest based upon a weekend. But the rest, this rest is a condition of the soul. Now the rest that God offers requires acknowledgement that God and everyone else can survive without us. God and everyone else can survive uh, without us. Now, um, for those of you that don't know, I retired about a year ago. That's a celebration song of retirement, huh? I retired about a a year ago. And uh, when I retired, to be honest with you, in the back of my mind, and often even in the front of my mind, I was wondering, what are they going to do without me? But in in retirement, you find out they do just fine without you. (laughs) But this is a realization, entering into God's rest, you have to acknowledge that life isn't just about me. That God doesn't need me. It, It requires us to recognize that I can't, and only God can. It's a total surrender to the ways of God. So this means that rest requires faith. Rest requires faith. Resting in God is, is tied to faith, which is why so many days we can not experience rest because we're not living in faith. In fact, um, I've found that I work real hard, and I did when I was a pastor also. I worked real hard so everything was set up and everything was thought through so I didn't have to live in faith. Do you ever live like that? We can become proud that we're so good that life does not require faith. When, when we rest, the rest that this word speaks about, we accept God's grace. And it's where we do not seek to earn, but instead we receive. And it's where... Uh, We're not trying to justify, but we are justified by God. So Hebrews 4, which we're going to look at next, which has a connection to Psalm 95, is about restoration of rest in the soul. It contains the word rest some 10 times. And that we will find that rest, real rest, results not from our works, but instead from God's grace. It's not about trusting in me, but it's about trusting in him, in his strength, in his goodness, and in his grace. There's no floating around looking for something better, something else to trust in. It's receiving and accepting and believing that God really does love me. In fact, let's pause right now and, and, and address that. Do you believe that God loves you? He really loves you. And let me tell you this too. He knows everything about you. And he still really loves you. And it's not based upon what you do or what you did. And it's not based upon you, 
but it's based upon who he is and you having been created in the image of God. And that's the place that we rest. So rest isn't about me, it's about him. Now, the first word of the fourth chapter of Hebrews, let me turn there. Um, The first word is therefore. Now, when you look at God's word, and if you see the word therefore, uh, one of my teachers said you need to ask the question, uh, why is therefore therefore? So you look before Hebrews 4, and you find in uh, Hebrews 3, verses 17 through 19, the author of the book of Hebrews is warning them against a hardening of the heart. Do you know what I mean when I say hardening of the heart? Uh, Has anyone experienced hardening of the heart? I have. Now, hardening of the heart isn't cholesterol buildup in your veins and artery. A hardening of the heart is making the decision of not to trust in God. That's the hardening of the heart. So in Hebrews 3, the author is saying, watch out that your heart is not hardened because it brings consequences with it. And one of the consequences it brings with it, he tells us in Hebrews 4, is not entering into rest and using the example of Psalm 95. So Hebrews 4 and Psalm 95 go together. And Psalm 95 is quoted within Hebrews chapter 4. Pointing back at that story uh, that Psalm 95 points back to, and that was when the nation of Israel missed out on entering into God's promised rest. Uh, God had miraculously delivered them from slavery in Egypt. You know the story? And uh, he's going to lead them into the promised land. And they got to the edge of the promised land, and they chose, even though God had shown them of his greatness along the way, I mean, after all, they had a cloud by day leading them, and at night, there was a pillar of fire. That, that would have been amazing, huh? I'd love to see one someday, a pillar of fire of God's presence that was there every night. And then every morning when they woke up on the ground, do you remember what there was? Manna that would provide for their uh, nutritional needs, And if they needed water, uh, water would flow from a rock. Now, that was a pretty amazing life. And so they got to the edge of the promised land, ready to enter. And he he said, go spy out the land. And and 10 of the 12 spies came back and said, we are in trouble. And they chose to accept to live by fear instead of faith. Fear instead of faith. Anyone been there? Fear instead of faith? Yeah. If we choose fear over faith, we will not enter into God's rest. So that takes us to Hebrews 4. If you have your Bibles, Hebrews 4, and read verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let's be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it, For we also have uh, had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. Here's a quote from uh, Psalm 95. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work. And again in the passage above he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who were formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. 
Therefore God gave, again set a certain day, calling it today. With a long time later, he spoke through David, as was said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had been given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath day for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Now, after hearing that read, do any of you say, now what did he just say? That's happened sometimes when you book the, read the book of Hebrews. I mean, sometimes you have to read it a couple of times to get it. Uh, read this when you go home again and uh, let it go deep. Uh, let's look at it a little bit and see if we can figure it out. So it says there that the offer of entering into God's rest still stands. That's what the author is saying. It just wasn't for then, but it's for now too. Rest was available for the wandering Israelites, and it was offered to the Jewish Christians in the first century church. And in fact, it still is an offer that we can claim today. Isn't that amazing? We can claim it today. But if you uh, look at the first verse, this offer of rest is closely followed with a warning, do not fall short. Uh, the Israelites we've been speaking about fell short because, as I said, they chose to cave into fear instead of living by faith. They had heard the message of Moses. They'd witnessed wonders of God, and then they chose not to believe that God would do what he said he would do. So the obvious point here is that hearing and knowing is of no value unless it's acted upon. Hearing about God's rest this morning and even saying, oh, that makes sense, is of no value unless you act upon it. Here's a statement. It's up on the screen. It'll be in a second. There we go. Trusting upon God in faith means living on the edge with all, without all the answers while wholly depending on the one with all the answers. Let me read that once again. Trusting upon God in faith means living on the edge without all the answers while wholly depending on the one with all the answers. The, the rest we're talking about originates with God because when God was finished creating, he said that it was very good back in Genesis and it says that he rested on the seventh day, and it wasn't because he was tired. He was God. He rested as a symbol of the rest that he offers humankind. Adam and Eve were at rest in the Garden of Eden in its original fullest sense. They had everything they needed because they chose to rely on God for everything. He had completed his perfect work. He had given them work that would build them up, not tear them down. And they rested in his creation. The, the rest originates with God. And uh, all this rest was working out really good for, for Adam and Eve until, until they chose to listen to the suggestions of the serpent Satan, and they chose to act upon that. They chose to sin. They missed God's mark for their lives. 
and uh, everything fell apart. Read the Old Testament. But then, friends, we get to the New Testament. When Jesus came and made all things new again, and it will be fully fulfilled when he comes again and creates a new heaven and a new earth. I'm looking forward to that day. Um, verses 6 through 8 of Hebrews 4, once again, it says this, It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore God set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. The writer here quotes Psalm 95 again. You remember Joshua was the one that had taken the Israelites into the promised land uh, some 400 years before, actually, David wrote the words of Psalm 95. Yet David was offering his contemporaries the same rest that Joshua was offering his some 400 years later. And now in the first century, when the writer of Hebrews wrote this, he was offering them that same rest. And... Uh, that doesn't make sense if we think, oh, that rest that God was offering is some piece of real estate there in the Middle East that if they just would have gone through that first time, they would have been rest, and I would be profiting from it now. But it's more than a piece of real estate. It's a condition of the soul. It's a condition of the soul. So the word today in the seventh verse really does mean today. Today. Isn't that amazing? Today means today. It does mean today. It means today. The opportunity to enter into God's rest is valid for today. For you and me. This is a today message. My rest in Jesus today is not experienced upon my yesterday. It's a today message. I have to experience today's rest by submitting myself to God today. It's kind of like that manna story. It's only good for one day. Now, what I do today impacts where I'll be tomorrow, but my rest for tomorrow is experienced upon my submitting to God tomorrow. So it's a continuous today message today of rest god's rest is new every morning i think i've heard that somewhere in another one of the psalms it's really true verses 9 and 10 there remains then a sabbath rest for the people of god anyone for anyone who enters god's rest also rests from his own work just as God did from his. Now, the Greek word for rest that I've been reading all this time in the book of Hebrews was really the Greek word for rest that was common to the day. But now the writer of Hebrews uses a brand new word for the word rest that is only used here and is used nowhere else. It's not used again in scripture. This is a unique word. And the translator here translates it as saying Sabbath rest. Sabbath rest. This is a new type of rest. So uh, by using this word, the author is telling us that this is a new deal. This is a different rest from common rest. This is real Soul depth rest, Sabbath rest. Now, God gave the Israelites the law and established a rhythm of work and rest. Every seven days was Sabbath, and what were they called to do on the Sabbath day? Rest. And then he also set up in the law that every seventh year, there'd be a year where they would let their crops rest, 
And so uh, they would have to trust in God that he would give them enough the year before that they could live for a whole year. So to experience that Sabbath rest, they had to trust in God that he would take care of their needs. And then listen to this. Every seven times seven years or every 50th year, they would have Sabbath years back to back. It was called the year of Jubilee. And so they had to trust in God for two straight years that he would take care of their needs. Trust. Trust. There must be something about trust in that equation of taking us to that place of Sabbath rest. And that trust has God as the object of it. Trusting in God. The Sabbath rest of verse 9 is a rest that's only entered into with complete faith in God. Coming to the end of self-effort and having enough faith in God to believe that he will do what he's promised. It's really living off the grace of God. And uh, Jesus had something to say about this. In Matthew chapter 11, uh, one of those I'm sure you'll really uh, said, I remember that verse. Let me read it, Uh, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. These are the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If the, I don't, we miss a little bit out on the yoke language because we don't see yokes. Yokes, that, that piece of wood that would ho- hook two oxen together, and then they would pull the plow together. And uh, Jesus is inviting us to come alongside him and hook up with him and let him do the pulling for us. And that results in rest. So, this whole discussion about rest uh, brings us to a personal response in verse 11. And let me read verse 11 of Hebrews 4. It says, let us therefore, and when we see the word therefore, we ask the question, there you go. What's therefore, therefore? Okay, and so you say, okay, therefore, what have we just been learning? Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. So the author is saying, make every effort. The need to follow and obey is urgent. Make every effort and enter into this rest Because you need it. Because you need to desire it. Because we need to secure it. And we cannot secure it through self-effort. It comes from a gift of God through the finished work of Jesus Christ and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Rest is secured through faith that overcomes fear. So it's a faith thing. It's a trust thing. Uh, The world is screaming for rest. It's screaming for rest. Well, I need to be honest. My soul is screaming for rest. How about yours? Our, our society has followed the footsteps of the wilderness Hebrews by striving after everything except God. And friends, <laughs> we Jesus followers can very easily strive after those same things for rest. We, we try to manufacture rest, chasing all the rest in all the wrong places, uh, thinking it can be manufactured through 
distractions or entertainment or weekends or leisure activities or those anticipated summer vacations. But none of these, none of these are bad in themselves. Uh, but if we are re searching for soul rest, true rest, in these things, we'll be disappointed. In fact, our, our striving for rest can bring with it a hectic lifestyle that leaves us worn out. So what do we do? Where can rest be found? I'm so thankful for Hebrews 4 because it tells us where rest can be found. Look at verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So we don't have any secrets to God. And it's for our good when we're laid open and laid out. And one of the best places for that to happen is as we approach his word. Uh, because that's where we find answers. That's where our, our attitudes can be realigned. That's where our allegiances can be straightened out. God's word. Uh, reading God's word is not magical in itself, but the Holy Spirit then uses it to instruct us, and the word of God is used to point us in the right direction. So it's, it's critical that we're reading God's word if we want to enter into rest, because it tells us how. Now, there's a second thing uh, that the writer of Hebrews 4 says, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Now, when I read that, it's, it's talking about Jesus. I sigh when I read that because I think Jesus knows and he cares. And he's my sympathizing high priest. He can do something about it. That brings great hope to my soul, and, and let's go on. Uh, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So Jesus not only knows, but he's experienced it. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So what's the rhythm of life? As to be able to enter into rest, we need to trust in God. And the Bible helps us to trust because it tells us the truth about him. And then we can go to him in prayer and be honest because he knows everything anyway. And in that place where we're able to talk to our sympathizing Savior who knows about the stuff of life, as we talk to him, it says we will receive mercy and find grace in our time of need and enter into rest. Isn't that amazing? That's the God that loves me, and that's the God that we can love back. The God who gives us rest. So I don't know about you, but the circumstances of life can make me tired at times. Uh, the things of life are out of my control. And because they're out of my control, it can bring times of anxiousness and fear. People can disappoint us. We can disappoint ourselves. The pace and pressure of life can be exhausting. But God tells us we don't have to live in that place. 
because there's another way. Now, it's not found by escaping and quitting on all that life has to offer, although God might be calling some of us to change our lifestyle in certain ways. But true rest is found by living continuously with God in the midst of the stuff of life. And Sabbath rest is experienced by acting in faith and trusting in him who does what he promises. Genuine rest can never be found in a skill or a technique or an activity. It must flow from faith in Jesus Christ. And he is willing to take upon the burdens of our life continually because resting is a continual condition of the soul. And when we rest, we accept God's grace. Not that we are earning it, but instead we are receiving it. So my invitation to you is the invitation that God's word gives to you and to me. And that is to enter into God's rest today. And then do it again tomorrow. And then the next day. And every moment beyond. Let's pray. I just want to give you a moment of silence now just to ask the Spirit to help you to become aware. Aware of where he's speaking, aware of your life, aware of the space in which you need rest, the place that you've been taking back things into your control, the things that are out of your control that are wrecking your rest. And I don't know about you, but uh, those things have come to my mind, and the Spirit is bringing more. And I invite you now, and as you uh, ponder this later today and live in it this week, to continually take those things to God and give them back, choosing to trust in him and to enter his rest. And Holy Spirit, we cannot do this on our own. We need your help. We cannot live a supernatural life that this describes apart from you. We relinquish our control. We give you our striving. We give you our stubbornness. And by faith, we enter into your Sabbath rest. In Jesus' name.